Let us spend time praying to dedicate ourselves this morning into the hands of God and dedicate the day. Our Holy Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you gathered us together. Faithful mortal human beings, you have separated us from the darkness. You've given us another new morning. We honor and glorify your holy name. Hear us while we pray. Hear us while we sing. Hear us while we study your word. And while we pray, we ask that our prayers may be answered in accordance with God's will. Forgive us our sin. Remove every barrier, Lord, that may hinder us from seeing your son and yourself when he comes a second time. Speak to our souls, dear Jesus. Speak to us in that tenderest voice. Help us to understand what it is that you say to us. And it's my prayer that this day again, you will speak words of peace, encouragement, wisdom, admonition to our souls that are longing to be nourished. It is my prayer by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll be going through a couple of uh, uh, texts this morning to prove to us that God himself is not an order of confusion. That's our burden this morning, that we might be able to understand uh, how God works or how heaven works. Realize God is not a author of confusion. God does not author confusion. The Bible says in Titus chapter 1 from verse number 5, the Bible says that for this cause left I thee in Crete that thou should set in order the things that are wanting. Now Paul, in writing to Titus, Paul tells Titus that I am left in Crete. What's the reason for which Paul has left him in Crete? That he should be able to set in order all things that are wanting. That's beautiful. Reason being, Paul desired that every mission or every particular church he planted was to be run in order. And so Paul tells Titus, I have left you, reason being, I want you to set everything that is wanting to be in order. And we'll be able to see that principle in almost every principle of life. Everything that is not in order must be set in order. Everything that is wanting must be set in order. And ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. So Paul the Apostle appoints uh, Titus, that Titus may be able to do the ordination of elders in every other city. And then he's also told that he should set in order everything within the church of God. We are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40 says, let all things be done decently and in order. Let all things be done decently and not. There are a few things. Order is the law of life. If life has to be perfect, there must be order. Order is the law of heaven. And so that's why the Bible says, let all things be done with order. We are not going to do a few things in order. We are going to do all things in order in our home life, in our job life, in our church life, every other experience. Wherever God has called you to work, you must work orderly. Order is the law of heaven. Okay. So first... Peter chapter 2 verse 16. Interesting. So as free and you know that God has called us into liberty. We have been made free in Christ Jesus. But then you're told as free and not using your liberty for cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. So what that means is, yes, you're free. Yes, you should be independent. Yes, you should do things according to the dictates of our conscience. But then we are admonished to avoid the extreme of using the liberty 
that God has given us, the freedom that God has given us as a cloak, as a clothing, as a covering for maliciousness. So the liberty which God has given us should never be misused or should never be used to cause disorder in the work of God. That's what the scriptures say, that we should never use the liberty that Christ has given us as a cloak of maliciousness. So you need to understand the two extremes. That while we are not to uh, be in bondage, we are not to use the liberty which God has given us as a clock for maliciousness. Okay, First Corinthians um, uh, 1433 says, For God is not the author of confusion. God is not confusion. You understand? God is not confusion, is not the author of confusion, but is author of peace in all churches of the saints. Praise the Lord for that. God is the God of peace in all churches of the saints, is the God who authors peace in all churches of the saints. All right, so all churches of the saints, all churches that God is planting and bringing up, there must be order, there must be peace. That's exactly what God is saying. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse number 2. Fulfill ye then my joy. Fulfill ye then my joy. That ye be what? Like-minded. Yeah, where there is order, there is like-minded. People are binding together in ideas, in thoughts, in actions, in all these things, in truth. That's what we are being told there. We are told having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. That's why Jesus Christ's great prayer was that Christ prayed and said, Be ye one, one with another, as I and the Father, we are one. So we are asked that we be of one accord and of one mind. Now while studying the truth and being bound by the truth and the love of Jesus Christ, we might be able to do a greater work than while we hold to the truth and at the same time, we are divided amongst our own selves. And so that's why God is calling for love. Love whose bonds cannot be broken by anything in this world. It's not poverty, it's not distress, it's not affliction, it's not any of these things. You must be bound by the agape love of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And if that love dwells in us, we will be like-minded. We'll be of one mind. And that's why we are told in verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Do nothing in strife. Do nothing in vain glory. Do nothing to exalt yourself. Do nothing to pride yourself. Because the moment you do that, there will be a disorder. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. These are the principles of true order. That true order cannot come when we don't esteem other people better than ourselves. And that's what God is calling us to. All right. Let's continue seeking to know. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 says this. Submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God. That looks to me like when God says, children, obey your parents as it is in the Lord. And that's like God is calling us obey authorities as it is in the Lord. All these things must be done in the fear of who? Of God. That's beautiful. Okay, Romans 12 verses number 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Why am I dwelling about love? Like-mindedness, being of one mind, because there can be no order in a family where there is no love. You understand? So if we don't have love within the family set up, there is no order in that family. There is chaos from the children to the parents. So love is actually the basis of order. We need to understand that love is everything. God is love. And so if we don't have love, if we don't cherish love in our hearts, God says that above charity and above faith and above hope, or rather, above hope and above faith and above all these things is charity. It is love to fellow human beings super and love to the Father and His Son supremely. And so love is the basis of true order. All right, let's continue and see what God is saying. 
In chapter 12, verse 10, this is what the Bible says. Be kindly affection one to what? One to another. With brotherly love in honor, preferring another. So we must have the selflessness of Jesus Christ if we will have to restore order. You understand that? The selflessness of Jesus Christ is where I esteem one or prefer the other above myself. Okay, so let's look at order in creation. Did God have order in creation? Yes, God had order in creation. Why? Because God brought order out of confusion. There was confusion and chaos in this world. Before God created this beautiful world. In fact, the Bible says in Genesis 1 verses 2, and the earth was without form, and it was void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The earth was void, the earth was without form, the earth was filled with darkness, the earth was in confusion, things were not in order. You understand what I'm talking about now? But then God decided to bring order out of confusion. Now, I was studying with my young son about the creation. And then we were reading and reading and reading and reading and reading. And you know what we realized? God was a God of order. You understand? God began by saying, let there be light. And there was light. And then God begins and says, I want to separate the waters above and the waters beneath so that there can be air in between there. Good oxygen mixed with nitrogen, mixed with uh, what else? Yeah, carbon and all again, all this side, carbon dioxide, and all those things. Beautiful for the growth of plants, for you to breathe, and for the plants to be able to grow. Nitrogen was needed. All those elements were needed. God was orderly. He didn't put plants before he put the sun so that it can help the plant to have photosynthesis. You understand? God did not. I mean, create animals without grass to eat. He didn't create fish without water to live in. You understand? And so God ensured that there was a river, there was an ocean, there was a lake so that the fish would be in the water. And that was extremely beautiful for me that God created orderly in six days. And that order he constituted including time. God did not seek to create everything within a day. Of course, he could have done it, isn't it? Because it's the God of all things, but God was teaching us that as he was creating, he had a plan, I will create one, two, three, four, this day, and then it is end of the day, we must begin another day. You understand? So the principle is so beautiful that God was restoring order out of disorderliness. And you know what, friends? God says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and we are told, and beyond, what was it? It was very good. So at the end of creation, because all has been restored, what kind of world, a world, world are we seeing? A beautiful world. A very good world. A perfect world. Why? Because of order. What does that show us? That if in a confused movement, if in a confused church, if in a confused organization we restore order, what do you think we are going to receive? A very good one. A very good movement, a perfect movement. Character is going to be perfect. Elements are going to be perfected. Departments are going to be perfected. The work of God is going to improve heavily. Why? Because order has been restored out of confusion. Now look at how uh, the book of Psalms paints what comes out of order. Uh, the chief musician, David, says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth his world, his handiwork. Let me tell you, friends, you see what actually David is painting there? The heavens declare the glory of God. That means if order is restored in God's dear movement, then what's going to happen is, God says, heavens will declare the glory of God. And that means we can perfectly sound the first angel's message. Give God glory. Fear God, isn't it? There will be glory shining forth. We can sound that latter rain me I mean message, which is uh, there is another angel coming the up, the up down from heaven, and that angel filleth the earth with its glory. You understand? Revelation chapter 18. Okay? So there will be glory in the world, but what about the firmament showing forth his handiwork? 
Yes, every aspect of our body or every aspect of our departments of work will show forth the fact that God is leading us. So that's beautiful out of creation. Okay, look at what Isaiah says in Isaiah 40, 26. It says, lift up your eyes on eye and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number, he calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for he's strong in power and not one faileth. How many, how, how many of them fail? None, because of order. God, because of how he did his work with order and perfection, none of the hosts of heaven can fail in their circuit. The sun will continue to move. The moon continues to shine. The stars continues to go. The planets continues to move around their world. Their own. And that is because of order. That if we are orderly, none of the departments of God's work shall fail. All the departments will work perfectly. And I'm so thankful because God is showing us our best to be able to improve his work. Okay, so are angels orderly? That's the question. We have seen order in creation. But the question is, are angels orderly? Because angels are messengers, angels like we are messengers. But now they are messengers of God and we have to copy how they work for God so that we might know how best we can work for God. Isn't it? So we are to learn from the ministry of angels and look at what angels do. We are told angels are orderly. Psalms 103 verse 20. 103 verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do what? His commandments. Angels do the commandments of Jehovah, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Isn't it? So if God says to angels, do this, I think the angels are going to do just what God has told them to do. And he says they are in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. It's interesting, it says, are they not all ministering spirits? These are angels sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. So the same <coughs> angels that are kept to the commandments of God have been sent down here to minister to us who shall be heirs of salvation. Listen to how Ellen White paints this beautiful experience in the little book, um, Testimonies, Volume 1. Um, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, 649. Listen to how Ellen White paints this beautiful experience. Angels work hard, harmoniously. He says, perfect order characterizes all their movements, all right? There is perfect order in all their movements, you're told. More closely, we imitate the harmony, the more closely we imitate the harmony and order of angelic hosts, the more successfully will be the efforts of these heavenly agents on our behalf, okay? If we see no necessity for harmonious action, for order, and disorganize uh, and are disorderly and disciplined and disorganized in our course of action, angels who are organized and move in perfect order cannot work for us successfully. In fact, if you want to show uh, see the order in which angels work, study the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel. I, I think I'll bring up that next time. Okay. So we are told we cannot work perfectly and harmonize with angels if we are disorderly because they are ordered. We are told they turn away in grief. So when we have a disorderly group of people, angels turn away in what? In grief, for they are not authorized to bless what? You heard that? Angels are not authorized to bless this organization. They can never bless it. And if you've studied with us, the administration uh, of angels, all blessings from God comes to us through the ministry of God. Angels. So they cannot bless. That means we are going to miss the blessings of angels. Man, that means you're not going to get the lottery. That means you're not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Angels are not allowed to bless confusion to bless destruction and to bless disorganization. 
All who desire the cooperation of heavenly messengers must work in unison with them. Those who have the unction from on high will, with all the effort, encourage order, discipline, and union of action. And the angels of God can cooperate with them, but never, never will these heavenly messengers place their endorsement upon irregularity, disorganization, and disorder. All right? And then we're told all these evils are the result of Satan's efforts to awaken, to weaken our forces. Listen, it is Satan's what? These are Satan's effort to weaken our forces, my friends. I want you to understand what Satan is planning. He wants to weaken our forces and destroy courage and prevent successful what? Action. Let's continue to study, my friend. Is there order in family? Has God ordained that order is the only means of success in our families? Yes, God has done that. Look at this. The rules God has given for the government of his church are the rules we are reading from the book, uh, rather from uh, Manuscripts 49, 1901. Uh, the rules, uh, MS 49, for those who are writing, 1901. The rules that God has given for the government of his church are the rules parents are to follow in the church in the home. Then we are told, it is God's design that there shall be perfect order in the families of the earth. That's beautiful. It is God's design that there shall be perfect order in the families of the church preparatory to their union with the family in heaven amen so before we unite with the family in heaven there must begin by union in family in the world on this planet in other words what god is trying to tell us is very simple we cannot have order in heaven or seek to be in an orderly heaven if we've never learned order on this planet in our homes and in our churches you understand now so there is order in the home, and God compares that order in the home to order in the church, and he says those who embrace order in the home and order in the church, discipline in the home and discipline in the church, those are the very people only who are able to do what? To enter into the party gates of heaven and enjoy heaven because heaven is orderly. Angels are orderly. The Father and the Son have order because order is the law of heaven, isn't it? And Satan wanted to disorganize that order. You understand? And when he attempted it, what did the father do to him? He was expelled out of heaven. All right, so that is beautiful for us to just consider. Listen to what she says in Manuscripts 27, 18, 96. This is beautiful. She says, they are doing God the highest service by presenting to the world a well-ordered, well-disciplined families who not only fear the Lord, but honor and glorify him by their influence upon their families. How do we honor God? By giving to the world a well-ordered what? Families. A well-disciplined and a well-ordered family. And the family is just a small church, but what is called the home church. So that would only mean to me and to you, interestingly, that the only way the church can prove their highest service uh, to the world is by giving to the world a well-ordered movement, a well-ordered church, a well-ordered group, a well-ordered people of God. Okay, so those are just a few analogies that are interesting to think about. Okay, let me read maybe two more and then just stop there. Manuscript 60, 1903 says, <clears throat> Teach your children neatness and order. What are we to teach our children? Neatness and order. We are to teach them neatness and order. Encourage neatness and order. It is your duty to, uh, to your duty so to fit them that they will be capable in the years of caring for their own homes. So how can we be sure that God's movement will continue? God's church will continue? You must restore order, you understand? 
Because she says in the family, there must be honor and neatness so that they can be capable in the after years of caring for their own wants. Their own wants. If there is no order and all of you, God forbid, sleeps in the ground, where is the future of God's truth and God's movement? You understand what I'm talking about? Where is the future? That's the question that we are asking. If parents do not teach their children order and discipline, that home has no future, isn't it? The moment the parents dies, can those children manage their property? No. Certainly not. Because they are disordered. And that's the same principle in the church. When there is no order, if Zarab is not there, if Pastor Tom is not there, if Pastor Daniel is not there, if Brother Sam is not there, if Elder Kimari is not there, if Elder Kepa is not there, where? All the, in the movement is not there. The truth is no longer being preached and people go back to the world. That is why God is saying with order, there is continuity of the truth. And that's what we need to learn. Okay, <clears throat> so that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> a lot of things here. Now, I want to read for us a beautiful quote from, um, uh, I think this Christian experience, CE 135, uh, paragraph two, CE 135, uh, paragraph two, she says, she says, but although these difficulties exist, we need to abolish them to put an end to organization. I am sure that the Lord has wrought in the organization that I'm sure that the Lord has wrought or has blessed in the organization that has been perfected. There are a lot of blessings that come with perfection, order and organization. And the fact that we, there are discouraging features in the work should not be a thought or sufficient reason for this organization. Much light has been, was given to us in reference to the organization of churches, yet we had a hard battle to fight in the perfecting organization. But victory was gained at last. And now, shall the church be disorganized because of indifference, because of formality and pride? These are the things, my friends, that cause disorganization. Indifference, formality, and what, my friends? And then we are told, shall we go back to disorder because unconsecrated members of the church are placed upon the work a mold of man and sought fashion the, and sought to fashion the church to meet the popular standards? And then she says, no, isn't it? Let's look at something really interesting, unity in the body of Christ, because we need to understand that order begins by love and then Unity, and we are talking about unity not in anything but in the body of who? In the body of Christ. And then we'll be able to see the foundation of that same order that we are talking about. That that foundation is not a foundation that is made by any man, but rather it's a foundation made by Jesus Christ himself. All right, Ephesians 4 verse 1, where it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vacation wherewith you are called. She says in verse 2. It says in verse 2 rather. With all loneliness and meekness and long suffering, listen, forbearing one another in love. We talked about love? Yes. We show that love is the great principle in order. All right? You cannot exercise order without love. Now if you don't love your wife, your wife might not submit to you, isn't it? If you don't love your children, it might be a reason for them not obeying you, isn't it? That the best way to be able to get the children obedient is by loving your wife and loving them, isn't it? And so you realize love is the great principle in order. So Ephesians 4 verse 3 says, endeavoring to keep unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Verse 4 says, for there is one Body. And that's he said, unity in the body of Christ. And what's Christ? Christ is the truth, isn't it? So it's unity in the body of Christ, but not without truth, because outside truth, that is what? Ecumenism, isn't it? But we are not advocating for ecumenism. We are advocating for unity in the body of Christ, and that is in the truth. All right? And so we are told... <laughs> There is one body. We don't have two bodies. 
We don't have three bodies. There is one body, isn't it? So we'll be able to see how God forms this one body. There is one spirit, even as we are called, uh, in one hope of our calling. Verse 5 says, one Lord and one faith and one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and all through you all. And so this is a beautiful verse that we love to quote. But yet that verse does not only talk about one God, he's the Father of all, but it also talks about one hope, unity in the body of Christ. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, for as the body is how many? One. And as many members, so there are very many members, many ministries, many groups, many movements, <clears throat> many ministers, many missionaries, but we are told, for as the body is how many? It's one. I was in a meeting last week, and we learned about the vibe. And we realized that how many, how many stems or a trunk does that vine have? It's one, and then there are many branches, isn't it? So there are many branches, but they're all attached to one particular stem. And so they all receive life from that one particular one, one particular stem. So that is what we call unity in one, in diversity. And I know that Brother Sam will talk about that. And so you are able to see that all the branches are flourishing, producing fruits because they are united or connected to the main stem or trunk, which is Jesus Christ, the vine. And so Christ is able to supply all the branches with the very life of his life. And so it's one body that has many members and all the members of that one body being many are one world. Body. And then we are told, so also is Christ. Okay, verse 13 says, For by one Spirit, all of us here are baptized into what? And that one body is the body of Christ, which is the truth. So we are all baptized into one body, into the body of Christ. We are not baptized into a, a I mean, sex, sectarian, a disorganized, a fragmented. A, independent atom movement, but rather we are, we, 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 are, we are baptized, born into one body. And whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be born or free, and we have all been made to drink of that same one, spirit, and that the, the spirit, the Lord is what? That spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There is liberty. Okay, First Corinthians chapter one, there is a beautiful question. That is, as there in verse 13, is Christ what? Divided. divided. Is Christ divided? Is Christ disorganized? Is Christ disorderly? Suddenly not. Christ is not divided. And that's the question that, that should be our answer to that question. Okay, so why is God calling for order and organization? Because it's not a God of confusion. We'll look into these things deeper. I'm just giving you a, 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 a preface of our beginning. And it says in Ephesians 4.11, and he gave some what? Apostles. And some teachers. teachers. And some prophets. And some evangelists. And some pastors. And some teachers, isn't it? So we realize that all of us as we are sitting here, we are gifted differently, isn't it? We, we, I mean, we all don't have the same gift. You might not preach like myself. You might not be able to give studies like my brethren here. You might not be able to sing like another brother. You might not be able to know this thing like another brother. But all of us are given gifts in specific areas. Okay, so why did God give gifts to his church? Listen, it says, for the perfecting of the saints. That's why now Paul asks, what if the whole body was the hand? <laughs> You understand now? What if the whole body were the mouth? How much can we be able to do? How far can we be able to go? Can we be able to see where we are going to know? And so God given, gives diversity of gifts for a specific reason for the perfecting of the world. The saints, if we have different body parts, we are perfected. We can work. I can leave this place, go to town, buy a few things, go to the farm, uh, do some farming, bring food back home. My eye will see where I'm going to. My feet will take me there. My hands will do the work. You understand? So at the end of the day, what we have, a perfect work done, isn't it? So if we have a body of Christ, 
that is having all the elements, the hand, the eye, the mouth, the ear, all these things doing perfectly the work around the men. I don't think there is a day when the eye says, I think I need to be the greatest guy in the body because I'm the one who see. Can the high say that? No. The high say, no, no, no. I mean, I mean the ear says, no, I need to be the greatest guy because I am the one that hears everything. All of them preferring one above the other. They, they, they act faithfully their position. They are thankful to God that they all were created for their particular purpose. And so we also in the church ought to be thankful to God for the gifts that God has given us. And we are not to feel like we need to be envious because God has blessed someone with the gift of medical missionary work or the gift, someone with the gift of preaching or someone with the gift of apostleship. No, we should not be able to be jealous over this or have envy over this, but rather we should encourage one another so that they can perfect their gift and that in all of us perfecting our gift, we are told in perfecting our gifts, God perfects the saints for the work of the world, the ministry, isn't it? So you understand that one person cannot do all these things for the edifying of the body of God, of Christ. And we realize that the body of Christ, that's the church. And you realize that if we are all gifted differently and we accept all this, then the body of Christ will be what? Will be edified. Verse 13 says, still we all come in the unity of what? And of the knowledge of the son of who? This is more than just the end knowledge, isn't it? This is a practical knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is a practical experience now. Where Christ dwells in us and we are able to produce the character of Jesus Christ. Perfect knowledge of the son of God unto a perfect man, isn't it? This is the man that can be taken to heaven, a perfect man. And then we are told, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of what? What do you think Christ is waiting for? God is waiting with longing desires that the manifestation of the character of his son be revealed in the church and then his son will come and take us. And it cannot be done in disorganization. It cannot be done while we are disordered. It cannot be done while there is no love. It cannot be done while there is no unity in true in the body of Christ, isn't it? And then we are told that it will not only be that, but what about errors that are creeping into the church when we are united, when we are orderly, when discipline is restored, we are told that we henceforth be no more what? A confused group. I think a child is confused, isn't it? <laughs> a confused group means a childlike group, a childish group, all right? You know, that's childishness, all right? Everyone is doing what they want to do here and there, and all this confusion, that's confusion, childishness, you know. I, I have a young baby, and I know you touch this, touch this, they don't know what they're doing. Every, they're touching everything in the house. And at the end of the day, do you think you find some orderly house? Say, what? Well, a beautiful house. No. Everything is chaotic in the house. That's why the Bible says, when we grow into unity, order, and discipline, we shall cease to be children. Then what it means when we are confused people is that we are children. Have you ever seen it like that? We are children. And then we are told, when we are children, we are tossed to and fro and carried by every wind of doctrine. And so this one comes, we catch it in the air. And this one comes, we catch it in the air. You understand? Every wind of doctrine. And then you are saved by the slaying of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to be deceived. And then we are told in verse 15, it says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. What's the head of that boy? Christ. So that's a beautiful thing. Verse 16 says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplier, according to the factual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto a defying of itself in what? Love is the great principle, my friend. It's the great principle. Now, what's the foundation of this true organizational true order? We are told 
in Matthew chapter 16, verses number 18. <clears throat> Matthew 16, 18. Yet all that I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, that's Jesus Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not pre prevail against it. That organization was built upon what? Christ, the Son of God. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> you can read that from Isaiah 28, verse 16. I'll not read that for now. You can just write it down. Isaiah 28, verse 16. But I'll read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. All right? You become a fool that you may be wise. And what God is trying to say there is there's something that we need to realize. That if we thought, Paul says, we knew everything, then it's time to have us realize that we knew nothing. And only such a group of people that are self, are not self-sufficient, but feels the poverty of the soul can learn of Jesus Christ and of his righteousness. Ephesians, uh, rather I'll not read that because I've read it before. <clears throat> Let me just go now to what is the necessity of order? Why is God calling for order? What is the necessity of order? Uh, CET 192. CET 192. Listen to why the necessity of 192. Why is the necessity of order? It is nearly 40 years since organization was introduced among us as a people. That is in 1892. I was one of the numbers who had an experience in the establishment of it in the fact. I know the difficulties that we had to meet, the evils which it was designed to correct, and I have watched its influence in connection with the growth of the coach. That organization was to solve evils. There are evils, when they are disorganized, there are a lot of evils that are coming up that are not sorted out. Are you getting it? And we'll be able to talk about these things through the week. They are right among us as the people of God. And if we are serious about seeing Jesus when he comes a second time, all these evils must be corrected, friends, all right? And at an early stage in the world, God gave a special light upon this point. And this light, together with lessons that experience has taught us. Experience, all right? You know, if you've not had experience, man, you might not have learned. And if, if you fail to study history, what do you think is going to happen? You might repeat that history. So you might see that. So he says, lessons that experience as taught us should be carefully considered. And we are told now, listen carefully. <clears throat> okay, now this is CL27. It's a beautiful book, and all of you read it. Your life country living. 27, paragraph 3. Listen. 27, paragraph 3. Now, just now is the time when the perils of the last day are thickening around us. And we need wise men for counselors. A wise men for what? Those who are going to advise counsel, this must be wise men. And then we are told, not men who will feel it their duty to start up and create disorder. What's your duty, my friend? Is your duty to start up and create disorder? That God is saying, no, 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 that is not the people that he wants to use. But who cannot possibly give wise counsel and organize and arrange that every starting up shall bring order out of confusion. That's what God is telling us to my friend. Order out of confusion. It says, and rest and peace in obeying the word of the Lord. My friends, do you know that there is rest and peace in obedience to the word of God? That this is an experience that many of us are lacking in their families. We are lacking it in our churches. We are lacking it in our ministry. You receive calls, you receive people, and people seem to be anxious about something, worried about something. There is a lot of chaos. They seem not to have the experience of peace and rest in the truth. And it's because they have sought for counselors that are stirring up disorder and confusion. Right? 
And then we are, uh, we are told, let every man be found in his what? True place. To do some work for the master according to his several ability. <clears throat> okay, now let's continue to read the next, uh, the next line. How shall this be done? It's a good question, isn't it? Take my yoke upon you, said Jesus Christ, who hath brought you with his own precious blood, whose servant you are, and property you are, and learn of me. See that, for I am meek and lowly in what? That if you learn of the meekness and lowliness of Jesus Christ, and it will be very easy to work for the Lord just according to his part. And you shall find rest unto your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If everyone will come to Jesus in a teachable word, friends, can we come to Jesus in a teachable spirit? Surrendering our prejudices and preconceived ideas. If everyone will come to Jesus in a teachable spirit with contrition of heart, then he is in a condition of mind to be instructed and to learn of Jesus and obey his orders. It's my prayer that this week we'll come to the feet of Jesus and we'll learn of what Jesus said. Who do you think is the great disorganizer? Satan. He's the great disorganizer. Listen carefully, friends, as I read for you this beautiful word. This is important. I think um, this is Christian service, CHS 75, CHS 75, paragraph 5. Um, as we read down there, listen carefully to what it says. Who is this great disorganizer? It says, oh, how Saturn would rejoice if he could succeed in his efforts to get in among these people and disorganize the work at a time when power organization is what? That's what Saturn desires. And then he says, and will be the greatest power to keep out spurious uprising. What's the greatest power? organization. Yes, sir. Are we able to see these things clearly? This is just the preface, my friends. This is the great disorganizationism. And to refute claims not endorsed by the word of God, we want to hold the lines heavenly that there shall be no breaking down of the system of organization and order that has been built up by wise and careful labor. And then she says, license must not be given to disorderly elements that desire to control the work at this time. License must not be given. All right, so let's continue, my friends, and continue seeing what God is saying. In fact, I want us now to... Uh, <clears throat> now, there's this beautiful... Uh, I think this is in the experiences early experiences of uh, Ellen White and James White uh, in EXV uh, 54. Now, early experience, I think it's, it's a connection with the book and writings. Yes. Uh, you, might, you might be able to, but around, around page 15, paragraph uh, is EXV 54, 15 paragraph 1. EXV 54. EX. Yes. I don't know whether you, you guys are able to find it. Yes, this line of it. Okay, let me just read for you something that will help you. Okay. The Lord has shown me that gospel order has been too much neglected and fear. It's been too much what? Neglected and fear. It says that formality should be shunned, but in so doing, order should not be neglected. There is order in heaven. Amen. And then she says, there was order in the church when Christ was upon this world. Ah, and after his departure, order was strictly observed. Amen. Among his apostles. And now in these last days, while God is bringing his children into the unity of faith, there is more real need of order than ever before. Why? For as God is uniting his children, Satan and his evil angels are busy to prevent this unity and to destroy it. Okay? Therefore, men will be added into the field, 
men will be hurried away. Young men are running into the field. All men are coming into the truth. They are running into the field. They are saying, we are finishing the work. We are, we are ending the work. They are all in the field. They are hurried into the field. Men without what? Lacking judgment, perhaps not ruling well their own world. You see that, my friend? They cannot even rule their own world. But they are in the field. They want to rule God's world. God's act. All right? They can't rule their own house and not having order or government over very few that God has given charge of them at all. And then he says, yet they feel capable of having charge of the flock of God. Can't marry their children. They can't marry their wives. They can't marry their family. And they say, oh, no, no. I can marry a big charge of 100 people, or 1,000 people, and all these things. God is saying that this is disorganization. I don't know, this is, friends, this is going to be very beautiful. They make many wrong moves, and all the messengers are thought by those unacquainted with our faith to be like this self-sent man. So every messenger in that movement, they're going to be like this self-sent what? Man. And then we are told, and the cause of God is in the final state, done what? Reproach. And the truth is shunned by unbelievers. Why are people not coming to the truth? Misbehaving elders? Misbehaving church members? Young people that are misbehaving? And people are, I mean, they, the unbelievers look at the movement, they look at the conduct of the youth, they look at the conduct of the leaders, and because there was no order and organization to ensure that those who enter the field are qualified, they think that the whole movement is just like those misbehaving things. And then you are told, the truth is shunned by many unbelievers who are otherwise be candid and anxious to inquire at these things so. Men and so whose lives are not holy, who are unqualified to teach the present truth, enter the field without being acknowledged by the church or brethren generally. And confusion and disunion is the result. And then we are told some have a theory of the truth and can dwell upon arguments but lack what? They can debate, but they don't have spirituality. They can debate and win people to the truth. They say, we have formed a movement of those who have believed this truth, but that movement has no life in it. You understand what I'm talking about? Judgment and experience, and they will fail in many things, which is very necessary for one to possess before they can teach the present truth to others. Others have not the argument. But because a few brethren hear them pray well, all right, man, beautiful prayer. I can spot in a few words that you cannot spot in. I can quote a few verses in my prayer. All these flowery players, they can pray well and give an exciting exhortation now and then, press them into the field and engage in a work that God has not qualified them for. And when they have not sufficient experience and judgment for the work, Spiritual pride comes in, and they are lifted up and act under the deception of thinking that they are laborers. They do not know themselves. They lack sound judgment and patient reasoning. Talk boastingly of their world. Have you had men talking boastingly of themselves? Yeah. Yeah, we can talk boastingly of ourselves. But should we boast as Christians? Boast of my qualifications? Boast of my experience? Boast of my knowledge of the scriptures? Boast of my memory of texts? Boast of my ability to treat many patients? Boast of my long time in ministry? That Jesus said that if we desire to be with him, we must be the meekest people in this world. And then we are told, <clears throat> They boast themselves and assert many things which they cannot prove from the word of God. From the word of God. God knoweth this, therefore, he does not call such to labor in these perilous times. Because people cannot labor well. 
And this is very understand. But it says, and brethren should be careful and not push out those into the field whom God has not caused. Ah, oh, brethren, God, I know this. There must be a probationary time to understand and know clearly which men are fit to represent God's church. And you remember the apostles, they spent time to pray before getting Matthias? Yes. They spent time to pray. They spent time to pray. Now, you, you know, Paul was a great preacher. He was ordained and all those things, but he didn't just end like that. The church proved him. The church proved him and the church ordained him and sent him. So this man, who are not called of God, are generally the very ones that are most confident that they are what? Called. And that their labors are important. They go into the field and do not exert a good influence generally. Yet in some places, they have, um, they have measures of what? They say we are succeeding. We are bringing people to the truth. People are receiving the word. They have a measure of what? Which leads individual to think that they are surely called of what? I saw that it was not a positive evidence that men are called of God, that if you see a few people baptized, that's not evidence that I'm called of God. You understand? There is something more you need to look at. And then I saw that it was not a positive evidence that they are called of God because they have some success. For now, the angels of God are moving upon the hearts of his honest children to enlighten their understanding to the present truth that they may lay hold upon it and live. And even if self sent men put themselves where God does not put them and profess to be teachers and souls receive the truth by hearing them talk, this is no evidence that they are called of God. The souls who receive the truth from them receive it to be brought into trial and see the danger, my friend. Have you seen movements that arise and after a few months or years they are not there? Have you seen people who are once pious and after a few months they are not in the same truth? Why is these things happening? You see them all over our country, you see them all over Africa, you see them all over the world. Why can we continue? But the disciples, a small movement began, and they grew and grew. Not only in numbers, but character was daily perfected. Character of members of the church, character of the leaders. They daily looked not to man, but to Jesus Christ. It was their example. They were daily molded to be like Jesus Christ. And my friends, this is the test. Is the minister converted? Is the elder converted? Are the people in this movement asking themselves, what shall we do in order to be saved? Is their burden to see themselves sanctified by washing uh, 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 themselves and the regeneration of themselves by going to the lava? Listen carefully, as the priest before they offer sacrifices at the altar. You understand that? But men are rushing to the altar to offer sacrifices on behalf of sinners while they have not gone into the lava and washed themselves and cleansed themselves of sins. Private sins, secret sins, family sins, all these things. And God is calling us for a repentance, my friend. That he cannot bless us except we repent. That he cannot be able to bring us into a place where we can finish the work except we repent. That I've seen this thing for some time that God has put me in his work and there is a lot of talk about finishing the work but we don't know what constitutes finishing the work. That we can never finish the work if the work, if we do not desire that work to be finished in our lives. And if sin cannot end in our lives, how can it end in the church? Daily consecration of leaders and daily consecration of church members, this is what it means to grow in Christ. 
And we are told that those who run without considering this, they might see success, but these souls are led into trial and bondage as they afterward find that these men were not standing in the council of war. They see those men are already up, eating flesh. They are marrying other women. They are fornicating, committing untruth. All these forms of things, nasty things that God says are not to be mentioned among you. That their ministers are involved in that. All right? You understand what I'm talking about? And then he says, even if wicked men talk the truth, some may deceive it. But it does not bring those souls, those who talk, talked it, it does not bring those who talked it into any more favor with what? Wicked men are wicked men stay. According to the deception they practiced, and as they deceived those who are beloved of God and brought confusion into the church, so will their punishment be what? <laughs> My friend, is it, is it that a serious thing? Their punishment will be what? That I can walk out and minister, but if I bring people into confusion into the church, then your punishment is greater than if you never did that work. You understand? So will the punishment be greater, and their sins will not remain covered, but will be exposed in the day of God's fierce anger. The selves and messengers are a curse to the world. Because of God. Are you a blessing or a curse? Because of God. So what I'm asking myself, right? I'm not only talking to you guys. I'm asking myself, am I a blessing or a curse to the cause of God? Honest souls put confidence in them. Think that they are moving in the councils of God. That they are in union with the church and suffer them to administer the word. The church tells them, please, administer the ordinances of baptism, of holy communion, of all these things. The child education, administer them. But then, brothers and sisters, we are told to lead them down into the water and baptize them as, a, as duty is made plain that they must do their first works. And then, when light comes as it surely will, they are aware that these men are not what they understood them to what? God's called and chosen messengers. They are thrown into trials and doubt as to the truth they had what? And feel that they must learn it all over again and are troubled and perplexed by the enemy about all their experience, whether God has led them or not, and are not satisfied until they are again baptized and begin again. There will be a baptism. Many rebaptism. Because people came into the truth through excitement and confusion. You get it? We are told, and it is much more rebellious and wearing to the spirits of God's messengers to go into such places where those people have been. It's much difficult to work. All right? Who have exerted this wrong influence? God's servants have to deal plainly and not cover what, my friends? Wrongs. And then he says, but act openly, for they are standing between the living and the dead and must render an account of faithfulness of their mission and influence uh, and the influence they exert over the flock which the Lord God has made them overseers. Amen. Amen. My friends, we are seven eleven. And the Lord is still telling me I ought to say something a little bit about organization because I missed it yesterday and I know the Lord is trying to speak to us something that's very important. I just look about a few things uh, on the notes on organization in the New Testament. You see that order in the New Testament. <clears throat> now it all began by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 3 verse 30 says, and he goeth up into the mountain and calleth unto him whom he would. And I'm looking just at the preface of this because our brother Sam and Pastor Allen, we look deeply into this, into issues of uh, elders and deacons, but I want us to briefly look at the church of the apostles and how it was organized. 
All right? Yeah. Mark chapter 3, verse 13. And he goeth up into the mountain, and he calleth unto him whom he would. Who called him? Jesus. Whom he, he would. We don't call ourselves. Jesus calls. And he says, and they came unto what? Unto him. They called him whom? And verse 14 says, and he ordained 12. Who ordained them? Jesus. He ordained 12 that they should be with him, and he might send them forth to preach. Those who are ordained are sent forth to preach. I don't think that they are sent forth to do other casual jobs. They are sent forth to do what? To preach. Verse 15 says, And to have power to heal sickness and to cast out devils. So that's basically the calling of the disciples. The calling of the apostles. The beginning of the organization of the church. So we realize that the first step was now taken in the organization of the church that after Christ's departure, all right, I know I'm, I'm reading from DA 291. DA 291, paragraph 2, if you need to project it, don't watch it, and please follow. The first step was now to be taken in the organization of the church. That after Christ's departure was to be his representative on the world. Yeah. Yeah, so the first step Christ took was in organization. He called 12. He didn't just allow people to go on doing what they wanted to do, isn't it? It says no costly sanctuary was at their command. They didn't have a costly sanctuary, isn't it? But the Savior led his disciples to retreat, to the retreat he loved, and in their minds, the sacred experiences of that day were forever linked with the beauty of the mountain and the veil and the sea, okay? Then we are told in paragraph 3 down there, Jesus had called his disciples that he might send them forth as his witnesses to declare to the world that, he had, uh, that they had seen and heard of him. Their office was the most important to which human beings had ever been called. And then we are told, and was second only to that of Christ what? Himself. And they told they were to be workers together with God for the saving of the world. As in the Old Testament, the 12 patriarch stand as representative of Israel, so the 12 apostles were to stand as representatives of the gospel church. Okay, so we can also look at the book of Acts briefly, but I want us to know that the book of Acts reveals the next phase in this organization of the church, the establishment of the New Testament model of church membership or leadership. Soon after Christ's ascension, the apostles became overwhelmed by the demands of the first growing church in Jerusalem. And so what were they to do? To cope with these challenges confronting them, the apostles divided the leader responsibilities in the local church into two major areas. That's where we find the choosing of the deacons was the first thing, by the way, isn't it? Deacons. We had the apostles already, and the deacons, isn't it? Then the elders. That's how it, it happened. So the seven deacons were chosen to serve the tables. They'll talk about that. I won't talk about it right now. While the apostles confined themselves to prayer and to ministry of the word. Ministry of the word. That's basically how that church was organized. That church had apostles. That church had deacons. That church had elders, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'll not look into their qualifications and everything, Pastor Allen and Pastor, I think David seems to look into it. But basically, I understand that that church was organized. That apostles, it had elders, it had deacons, isn't it? But were their worship system also ordered? There are certain things they did and certain things they didn't do, isn't it? For example, you remember, I, I'm not looking too much about that, but uh, if you look at that New Testament organization, this is what Sister White says about it. So the appointed elders, I don't have to, uh, yeah, I think it is, um, which book is this? Acts of Apostles 91, paragraph 1. 
The organization of the church at Jerusalem was to serve as a model for the organization of churches in every other place where messengers of truth should win converts to the gospel. All right? The organization of the church at Jerusalem was to serve as a model for the organization of churches in every other place where messengers of truth should win converts to the gospel. So it was our model. Just like the education in Eden is our model. Isn't it? The diet in Eden is our model. So we can be able to see Madison was a model school, isn't it? And so we are also told the organization in Jerusalem was a model. So that is important for us to understand, just as we wrap up this. Again, I, I want to mention, that's my ending, and we'll, we'll go over and over this. God is not out of confusion. Now, God even in in services that were run in the churches in the apostolic time was not with, with confusion. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. What are some of the things that were in the worship service? So in speaking to yourself in what? Psalms and hymns and spiritual what? Singing and making melody in your heart to the what? So they were exhorted while they were worshiping that they were to have psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. By the way, did you know that the longest book in the Bible is a music. But that doesn't mean we need to spend more time singing than studying the word of God. But realize the book of Psalms is very spiritual. It is music with teachings of the Bibles and so on, isn't it? But in, in, in essence, it simply means that the Lord inhabited the, the praises of his people and that when good and beautiful music are sung in the church, angels rejoice and the presence of the Lord comes and joins his people. So music was part of the worship, and there was order. All right? Not everyone was introducing any kind of music you want, all this, and I think that was just some good one. Okay, Bible study was another thing that they had. First Timothy 4, 13. First Timothy 4, 13. Where is it all? Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. So they were to study the word of God, they were to exhort, they were to do visitations, to members of the church, they were to visit the sick, the elderly, all right? All this work was to be done, and they were also to teach doctrine, isn't it? That's very important. I found some of the things that they had to do. Bible study, fellowship, and breaking of bread. Fellowship and breaking of bread. That was another thing that was in their order. They were to fellowship, they were to break bread, have communion, and all these things. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So there were prayers, there was communion, there was fellowship, and all these things, I mean, it's beautiful because we are also told that the apostles were dedicated to the ministry of, uh, to prayer and the ministry of the word. So they were praying for uh, <clears throat> walking about, uh, encouraging people, praying for them, their problems, praying for the church, and they're also teaching the word of God, isn't it? So this is just among the things that you're seeing in the apostolic church, and how beautiful would this be in our churches? Music, studying the word of God, praying, testimonies, isn't it? Paul used to give testimony of his experience. So, I mean, there are just a lot of things that we can be able to learn, but for today, we want to ask ourselves, is God the author of confusion? No. But the Lord bless us in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's pray, and then we might have some minutes to ask questions and give comments. Let's pray. Holy Father in heaven, you just saw thank that you give us opportunity to study that you are not a God of confusion. Help us, dear Lord, to come into your words, to move under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel, accepting that we have messed up with ourselves, and if there was ever time that we needed order, it is now. Please help us now as we surrender our lives to be to be used to be. And every one of us watching online, those of us who are in this congregation, the various leaders that have come, the Lord, you may bless us with spiritual graces of order. So I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
Amen. Amen.